In this video, we are going to go ahead and set up a starting and ending scenario. So that way we have a basic user interface showing us the starting of the game and then popping back up when we end. We'll also put in a quick little flashing of our player score so that way they can be notified when the next level is about to start. The next wave, not level. So let's jump right into that. To start up with, we are going to need a menu, and this is honestly going to be a giant pain in the butt because we're using line traces for our interface, and I'm not using like a magic wand or a constant light, light constant beam to show you where you're at. We're just doing something simple. You're just going to shoot the interface, and it's going to react. But because of that, we need to do a few special things. You can't really use the mouse to interact with your interface in VR. So let's create our user interface for our main menu. To let's see, user interface, widget blueprint, and we'll call this the in game menu widget. Yeah, we'll just make it super simple because I can't really think of another name to make it better. And of course, we're going to need a blueprint. So blueprint, actor, we'll call this one the in-game menu blueprint. Try to keep things organized. And actually, let's just go ahead and set up our blueprint. This is going to be the exact, almost 90%, 80% of this is going to be identical to what we did for the score menu. So let's make sure that we open up the blueprint itself and we open up the widget. If I can find the widget, there we go. And then for our blueprint, we're going to replace our root because reasons. And we are going to go ahead and just instinctively compile a save. I don't know why, but it's what it is. We'll add a widget like before. And our widget is going to be a widget class in game menu widget and that's all we need to do for now for this we need to actually create the menu widget or we can't really do anything with it so again there's a couple ways to do this one um i'm gonna make it where i showed it on the video where you have larger start and quit game but if this was a production project I would probably separate the start and the quit into separate things. That way I could physically move them apart farther and it was less of a chance of someone accidentally hitting something. Now one thing that's kind of cool, and this is stuff I have done in other projects and much, much more complicated and beyond this example. But you could shoot out a line trace every frame rather than just when you shot it. And you could use that to see what you hit, which is basically what we're going to do here. Except instead of every frame, we're going to do it only when we pull the trigger. And based on that, you could actually highlight what you're looking over. So you could use that little, like you've seen in other games, possibly using the Vive. You could use the little fake light beam. Or you could even just not even use the light beam and just shoot nothing out and just highlight the things as you mouse over them mouse over them controller over them so let me go ahead and set that up right now and assuming i can get it to cooperate there we go okay so make this quick and simple we don't need a canvas panel we don't need to rename it we need to delete it we're going to do the same thing as before we'll do an overlay in our overlay we're going to put a vertical box our vertical box is going to hold two buttons, a start button and a quit button. So that should be simple. If we can find our buttons, button and button. Inside of our buttons, we hold text because without text, we can't see what we're doing. We'll rename this one to start game. And we'll rename this one to quit game. Simple enough. Now, we want to make sure that they're going to fit where we're going to put these in the scene. And in order to do that, we're going to need to make sure we have some alignment options set up, some stretching options, some fill options, things like that. So we want our vertical box to basically take up everything. So I'll click on a vertical box. 
tell it to stretch, boom. Now our vertical box will fill whatever size we want. Same thing with our buttons. We want them to be big and be big. The problem is they're designed to only, sit, only take up as much space as they need. We fix that by clicking the fill button. Boom, we have giant buttons. Text is a little bit small. This is one of those things where you have to adjust it based on your settings. I'm just going to go ahead and type in 52 because it's a cool number. And that's it. This is all we're going to need to do for the actual interface itself. What's going to happen when we do buttons and things like that are completely separate. This is all we're going to do for now. What we need to set up is the blueprint itself for the menu. Let's go ahead and since we have our widget, let's go ahead and slap this into our scene. So we want the in-game menu blueprint. We'll put it in here. Should be on the other side. Yep. So we're going to rotate it. 180 degrees. And we'll move it not that way. Let's move it up. And let's see. I think it was negative 400, right? Bam. Center. Just like that. And there we go. We have a play game and start game. If we look at it, of course, I move my camp headset. Let's rotate that back. There we go. We have a play and a start game. Giant buttons right there in the middle of nothing. That's good. That's what we want. Let's give it a little bit of a spacing. Let's take this button right here and let's tell it we want, uh, let's go with 20 padding on the top. Run that again and give it, there we go. Now we got a little bit of space between the buttons. You know what? Actually, what if we did something like 60? Give us a little bit more space. There we go. Now we've got a little bit more space. So we're good there. For the sizing, the sizing of what it looks like in the scene is based on this, our 500 by 500. Because I chose in our widget to stretch everything, basically to fit everything, it's going to allow me to adjust the settings in here. So let's say I wanted this to be 500 and I wanted this to be 400. You'll notice we now have a 5x4, and if we go into the game itself, we now have our buttons looking like that. If you did not set these things using like an overlay or a box that allows you to fill things, it's going to go from the top left down, and we're going to have to size things exactly. This was designed so that way I could resize these buttons in here in my widget blueprint exactly like I wanted. So. Here's our next really difficult part. Inside of the actual game in here, we're going to need to set up collision. We need to set up collision because these buttons themselves are not going to react appropriately to what we want when we shoot them. We're going to set up some collision boxes that will then have tags that will then tell our blueprint what to do when we shoot them. And these are pretty simple. So we'll go and add a box collider. So add box collision. And we'll go and add another one called box collision. And we have two box collisions. In terms of size, you're going to want to go ahead and try to fit these as best as possible. Then you use the box extent to do it. So something like this. We have like 10. And then we have 200. And we have 70. We'll move this up. And we have it something like that. If we resize this a bit, let's go with what, 240? Let's see, 240 look right. I don't think it's tall enough. So what do we want to go with like 80? I don't think it's centered properly either. So this is one of those things that based on how you set it up, you know what, that's close enough. Let's Let's maybe move that up, let's see, up 115. This is one of those things where you have to adjust based on the size. But basically, you want a box that encompasses our collision. So if we're shooting this thing straight on, we want to make sure we hit that box. Let's go ahead and copy this and apply it to our other box. So that way we know it's the same size. We'll drag it down to fit appropriately. Hopefully, it's going to need to go negative 115. And that's close enough. We're not doing perfection here. We're just getting some boxes working. Let's rename these to make them easier. So we'll go with 
start box. And we'll name this one quit box. And those are going to be our targets, the start box and the quit box. Now I mentioned earlier that we are going to use tags in order to determine if we're hitting something. If we hit this, our hit result is going to give us this back as the actor. But in addition to the hit result as the actor, we have the component. And it can tell us if we hit the widget or any of these collision boxes. If we didn't have the collision boxes, we'd only know we hit the widget. With the collision boxes, now we can know that we're hitting either the start box or the quit box. So we're going to go ahead and we will set this up so that way we have tags so we know exactly what we're, we're hitting. So start box, scroll down, component tag, add, and we'll call this one the start box. Quit box, add, quit box. Now when we hit these, we'll actually know what we're hitting. We're good to go there. So what do we want to do next? Well, we need to create an interface so that way we can talk to everything. So the game menu itself needs a blueprint interface. So interfaces, make another blueprint interface. Calls one blueprint interface. Uh, this one was with the end game menu, menu blueprint. There we go. Boop. And what are we going to do? Well, this is going to be basically an interaction event. So we'll call it interact with menu. Yep, let's actually interact with menu. Menu. There we go. And it's going to need to know what we hit in terms of component. I mentioned that earlier. I will show you that here. If we go to our player and we look at our trace result, we have right here the hit component. And this is a primitive component reference. So if we go into here and we go into here and we'll do this one the hit comp and we'll go to primitive component reference and now we have a primitive component reference. We'll know what we hit. We can close down our interface, go back to our blueprint and tell it use the interface. Bam, just like there. So now we have that event. Now we need to actually do something with the event, obviously. So we're going to make a pretty simple little thing that's just going to cascade. We'll close all this up. We'll call this interact with menu. And we're going to basically check and see what we're hitting and do something appropriately. So as tag, we have component has tag. Does the component we hit have our tag? We'll go with the start box. Actually, let's go with, yeah, we'll go with start box. We'll go start box first. If it has start box as the tag, we are going to do something appropriately. If it does not, well, we want to do the same thing on our false. Quit box. And if it's quit, then we'll do quit. Now, I did notice one thing. Let me move these down to keep them out of the way. I don't think you're supposed to be quitting outside of I don't think you're supposed to be quitting in a VR game. I noticed that my headset seems to have issues when I do that. So I wouldn't recommend doing this unless you know for sure. But for our example, this gives us another button to hit and it gives us something tangible. Maybe you have settings in there. So if you notice I went ahead and hooked this up for my component has tag. So now basically depending on what we hit it's going to do something. We need to actually do something here. So we need to somehow call the event interact with menu. Well, where do we do that at? When this is shot, we want this called. So chances are we need to actually have this fire off when we're shooting something. Where are we shooting things? Well, that should be pretty simple. We're shooting them in our player. So over here, we have this happen. We do our spawn, we do our emitters, we check to see if it's an enemy and we tell it to hit. Hopefully it's pretty simple to determine what we should do next. We can go copy and paste. If we did not hit something that implements enemy, maybe it implements the game menu blueprint. 
if it does implement the game menu blueprint, then we want to go ahead and call the game menu blueprint. Hit actor. And this was the interact with menu message. And we'll call the interact with menu message, just like that. Now I'm going to go and move this down. We need our hit component because that's what we're going to pass along right here. We'll move this all the way over here like that. Move this up. Reorganize this to be a little bit less. There we go. Something like that. And there we go. So now in theory, if we hit something that has our in-game menu on it, it's going to go ahead and interact with it. Now, if I was to run this now and play, we, well, we need to stop the game from starting. So let's find our um, game mode. And remember right here where we have this set to spawn, we shut that off. We no longer want it to automatically spawn. So there we go. Now we have a game menu. We have a game mode. Let me fire up the controller and fire at stuff and try to aim horribly, horribly wrong. Okay, so right now I'm hitting the start game and the quit game. And the problem is nothing is happening. It should be doing something, but it's not. The problem with that is when we are firing off our line trace, we are firing against the visibility channel. If we go into our blueprint and check out these things, by default they're set to overlap all dynamic. They are not going to block the visibility channel. So a really simple way of doing this is switch this to UI. Switch this to UI. And you'll notice now it's set to default blocking the visibility channel. If we go back to here, tracing visibility, blocking visibility. If we run this now, assuming I hooked it up right, the game should quit when we fired on quit. And there you go, you just saw it happen. That's one reason why to also hook up the quit, just it's an easy way of debugging. If a game quits, it, it worked. So that's it right there. We now have our start and our quit hooked up and running properly. Well, technically start's not because we're not actually doing anything, but the quit button works properly. So what is the next thing we want to do? Well, we need to actually start the game. This one's nice and simple. Do we have an interface for our game mode yet? Nope. Our game mode handles everything. Let's tell our game mode to simply start the game. Make a new interface. I love interfaces. They have useful uses. Game mode. And we'll call this one start game. We'll actually make another one called quit game, just in case. It can't really hurt to have it there. If we don't use it, maybe we'll use it. So now we have a interface for our game mode for starting the game. Find our game mode. Now we're going to add the game mode interface. And now we can actually do something. Start game. We have the event start game. And this is when we call it. Now, what do we do when we start the game? Well, this should be pretty simple. We want to spawn enemy wave. We'll just drag it over here. Bam, there we go. Now, if we click start, let's see if I can actually hit the start button instead of the quit button. We should have enemy waves spawning right now, which you can't really tell because I probably didn't hook it. Oh, that's a <laughs> So if something doesn't work the first time, make sure you actually hooked it up. So when we go over here and see if it has start box, we kind of didn't actually hook it up. Let's get our game mode. And this was the point of making an interface and call start game on the interface. And actually hook this up and reroute this over here a little bit. There we go, something like that. Now, if we shoot start game this time, now that it's supposed to do something, we have some things spawning. And actually, if you notice, if we keep shooting it, we're going to have a serious issue as stuff starts spawning. So, small issue, easy to fix. Well, how do we fix it? Oh, it's pretty simple. If we don't see it, and we get rid of the collision, then we are not going to be able to hit it. So what we're going to want to do when we start, and this is the reason why we use the interfaces and we have things handle each other. Now that we have a start game event here, we're simply going to 
set our collision and our actor to be hidden before we spawn the wave. And this is really simple. We need our in-game menu and we need to be able to hide it. Now, how do we get our in-game menu? Well, right now we have a enemy spawners, right? Well, do the same thing. Let's go ahead and get interface. That was widgets. Let's try that again. Make sure you get all actors with interface, not widgets with interface. Make sure it is our in-game menu, blueprint interface. We're going to get our first one, just like we did before. We only have one, and we'll promote it to a variable. We're going to go ahead and call this one the in-game menu reference. And save. Now we go in here. Now we get our in-game menu reference, and we set actor hidden. And new hidden and spawn. Bam. Now when we fire on it, we should have it start and it should hide itself, assuming once again I can aim. But here's an issue you're gonna run into. If I get down to quit without my controller shutting off, because apparently my battery just went dead. That was annoying. It's still gonna quit. And you may be asking, well, why is that? Well, just because we set the actor hidden in the game doesn't mean the collision is disabled. So we're going to need to actually shut the collision off as well. And that's really simple. We'll set collision, new actor enable collision. By default, it's disabled. We'll go ahead and say, yep, default, that sounds good. And we'll make sure it's set to off. And there we go. Now it is set to off. And if we were to go ahead and run again, let me go ahead and fire. And every, you'll notice as I keep firing, nothing's happening, and quit doesn't do anything anymore. And maybe I can shoot something. Nope. Okay, so there we go. Now we have the it hiding, and we have it showing, and we have it going, and we're good to go there. So what else would we want to do? Well, we don't actually have an end event. We have the starting event, but what happens when it's game over? Let's handle game over. It's at a custom event. We'll call it handle game over. The nice thing about this is we pretty much already have a section set up for handling game over in the spawn wave right here. So we'll go into our event graph, go into our spawn wave, and you'll notice here this is what's supposed to happen when the game is over. We'll just do handle game over. And now it's going to call a game over event. For handling the game over, all we're going to do is basically the opposite of this. We're going to unhide the menu and enable our collision. Let's go ahead and save that. Let's go ahead and run that and oh, let's let's make this shorter. Let's go ahead and set the enemies per wave and we'll disable this back down to Oops, delete. We'll give ourselves just two. Now we have two waves. Let's go ahead and run this. We'll start the game. We should end up getting two waves of various amounts. Now we still have no indicator of when the waves start. That will be covered in the next video for a little bit of UI polish as well as performance. But for now, we should have our two waves running. Once the two waves are running and our spawn timer is over, our menu should pop back up. We can either start it again, or we can quit. Now one issue there that you did not notice, because I wasn't able to hit anything, is our score was not resetting. Why wasn't our score resetting? Well, because we never told it to reset. Well, awesome part, we've already designed the ability to do that. If we get our player pawn, and we tell it to reset the score, it's going to reset our score. We don't have to cast to our pawn. We don't have to do anything special. We already set up inside of our player an event called reset score using our blueprint interface. We're already using it in the beginning of the game. Actually, we're not using it in the beginning of the game. Wait, are we? No, actually, for some reason, I did not set it up to do that. So, you know what? Let's go here under the player. 
That's funny. And let's just reset the score because we can. So begin play, right? Does that show zero? No, it shows zero. So somewhere in here I'm updating the score. Oh, right, right here. I'm already, no, it's the score BP. Why am I setting the score to zero when the game starts? Hmm. Oh, that's weird. Wait, let's see where reset score is called from. Find references. Uh, this is the only place I'm calling it. Hmm. Oh. Right there. I Where I just added it in. So, so when you start the... No, that's when you start the game. Okay, well, color me confused. Somewhere in there I set it up where it's automatically resetting the score. I'm sure somewhere in one of the videos I did it, that's highly amusing. But when you do this, now when we restart the game, let's see if we can get something shot. Can you actually give me, you can see this. Oh, come on, come on. Oh, dang damn it. Come on, give me a target I can hit. Oh, there we go, score one. All right, I actually got one. So now when this is over, I should have score of one. I should have the ability to start over. When I start the game over again, it should restart back to zero. And it is not. So we have an issue with the start game not working. So we are currently having a problem where once we hit the start game for the second time, it doesn't look like there's anything happening. But that's actually not the truth. We have two things that make it seem that way and only by debugging would we have been able to figure that out. So, if I actually went ahead and debugged it, we'd find everything was firing properly. The problem was twofold. One, we have our event reset score here in our player. Well, all we're doing is resetting the physical score, but not the visual score. So that's a small issue. We need to actually copy and paste here. Let's go ahead and set this to here. And let's go ahead and run this again. Now if we run and once again try to actually hit something. Let's see, where are we shooting at? And of course the gun's not being detected. Oh, figures. I think it might have switched over to the other gun. Let's see, what's happening here? Yep, there we go. Oops. And we break point. We notice it's interacting with the menu properly and it's calling what it's supposed to. And we can see we start the game. And of course, I'm not going to be able to hit crap. Am I? Nope. Okay. Okay. So, once this ends, uh, see the issue here is. Uh, you can't tell because I didn't hit anything that time. So let's run through this again. Unfortunately, this makes a pain in the butt to debug. Let's make sure I hit something this time. Oh, that was a fast one. Oh, man. I got actually hit. Okay. Hit nothing yet again. Let's try this one. Let's try this one more time. This makes it a lot of fun for debugging if you don't have the headset on. Okay, come on, hit something. Oh, damn it. There we go. Okay, so we have one. Now, the problem was before we thought when we hit start, nothing was actually happening. That's not the case. It was actually running through properly. It was actually running the start game again. But it was tripping over the fact that it had already finished the game and the game itself wasn't reset. So if I hit start game again, you'll notice it. player score changed to zero that time. Player, chair, player score changed to zero because we are properly running through our start game and now we're actually updating the display. This is where the problem comes in. When we hit spawn enemy wave, it's checking our current wave number. Well, we never actually reset the current wave number. We never set that anywhere. We should be setting the current wave number to zero whenever we go ahead and we start a new game. So that's an issue that we're going to have to deal with here. 
So if we go ahead and probably after resetting score might be smarter. So let's go ahead and start a new game, reset the score, and then we're going to set the current wave number to zero. Now, when we go ahead and fire this up, we can go ahead and successfully start a game and oh, try my hardest to hit something horribly, horribly wrong. There we go, got something. We'll watch it go ahead and run through. We should run through our second wave here in a second. Ooh, almost got two that time. Oh, nope. Oh, I got two that time. Okay, so we got two. It'll reset. We'll go back to the game starting over, hit start game, and we're back to the beginning. I actually got one easier that time. So that is going to wrap up this section. We went ahead and we covered creating a menu we can interact with with our gun itself by using line traces and a few collision boxes. We handled starting the game from scratch so that way it doesn't just jump right into it. We handled the game ending and doing nothing. We handled a restarting by resetting our score and setting our wave back down to zero. In the next video, we're going to handle a few different niceties. We're going to cover some performance things and ways to profile your performance as well as some things you might want to shut off in general that you don't want for VR. And then we're also going to make it where you can visibly tell when the next wave is starting because as you may have noticed, without an always on-screen UI, it's a little hard to keep track of what's going on.